Luke chapter 4, we'll read verse 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Now, notice the wording right here. Satan, he controls all the kingdoms of the world. He says right here, uh, these kingdoms, in verse 6, are delivered unto me. To whomsoever I will, I give it. So he can give it to certain people in this world. If you look at verse 12, And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed. Well, praise the Lord. So the devil's work has been defeated. But notice from him for how long? For a season. So the devil, he doesn't go away permanently. He's only driv driven away temporarily. And that's what you're going to see in this timeline that matches a lot with this case in Luke chapter 4. Satan, he gives the kingdom of the world to a certain ruler who's a great type of the Antichrist. Next to Adolf Hitler would be Napoleon Bonaparte. So Napoleon Bonaparte, he is given the kingdoms of the world by Satan. However, in the meantime, behind the scenes, remember the Great Awakening revivals are going. Remember that the Christians have laid a foundation and the Baptists have laid a foundation in America, even in England. And the revival is spreading. Yeah. So even though the devil tries to disrupt everything with the chaos of war, The Lord Jesus Christ has his ministry spread out. Preaching is still continuing. So the devil, he does back off. And you're going to see that after the Napoleonic Wars. You see how the Christian ministry is still continuing. The devil's plans are foiled. However, it's only for a season during the Great Awakening revivals. You're going to notice that every time the Great Awakening revival is going on, the devil, even though he departs for a season... So he departs, but it's just for a season. That's the thing to understand. Because he's laying down foundations and insidious plans where he's going to build up his world government again. That's important to hear. That's important to understand. Behind the scenes, while the Christian Bible believers are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen. Satan's job is to temporarily depart and build up his one world government. Okay? And you're going to see that it's always through secular powers that he's building his one world government. But in order to uh, build it up, he does have to destroy the church. So he's going to mingle. Guess what? Now we've always emphasized this church and state together. Remember, that's how the Roman Catholic monster was born. Remember, that's the thorn on the side with Calvinism throughout church history. Remember, that was the issue even in the early days of America. The devil always tried to do these means. To build up a one-world government, he needs a one-world religion to receive worship. He's not just going to rule. He wants worship. So it's important that religion and politics mix. It's important that church and state mingles together. The Bible-believing Christians have never done that. Now, true, if it comes to... The politics, where there are certain sins that we have to call out, where we have to make people aware, then we will do that. Yeah. However, you notice that we don't get actively or so heavily involved in that. Yeah. Because the reason why is then we're thinking about a the theocracy again. That's what Calvin tried to do. And you notice it wasn't really workable. It didn't really work. We're Bible-believing dispensationalists. We're not covenant theology. We're not post-millennial. We're not amillennial. Yeah. We're premillennial, dispensational, Bible-believing Baptists. That's so important for our history, and you've seen how God's Holy Spirit always blessed Amen. the people, the church, and even the lost world surrounding them Amen. through such means. So you're going to notice how the devil, he'll depart for a season, okay? Uh, but he's building out foundations for the world government. So let's look at how this goes. Let's start off with Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, some will go Bonaparte, Bonaparte, I don't care. I'm just going to pronounce whatever wrong way I want to. He don't deserve, he don't deserve his name to be pronounced correctly anyways, okay? 
Don't forget the Jesuits, the Masons, and then the elitists who all fled to secret societies. Remember that? Jesuits are not done. Recall they've been kicked out by the Pope and the Vatican, by Catholic countries, and they've also been kicked out by Protestant nations. Because they've been kicked out, how are they going to regain their power again? How are they going to be reinstated again? It's quite a coincidence that after the Napoleonic era, Jesuits were able to be reinstated. The timing is very strange. That's one. Number two, it is very strange that whatever country Napoleon conquered, including the Vatican and the Pope, is seen to be in the terrain and the areas that kicked out the Jesuits originally. If you were to think about that. That's pretty strange, isn't it? It's pretty strange. So before we cover the Catholics and the Jesuits, let's first cover Dr. Upman's book on church history on page 133. And then let's see what the Catholics can still gain out of this. Dr. Upman says, now all of this belongs in the realm of anti-church history, for it deals with Catholic conspiracies and Catholic counter-offensives against the worldwide teaching and preaching of the AV 1611. When Napoleon, a baptized and confirmed Roman Catholic, rose to power, he immediately made a concordant uh, with the Pope, as did Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini and then set out as Charlemagne, baptized and confirmed Roman Catholic, had set out to bring in the kingdom by armed force. When Napoleon crowned himself, he didn't repeat Charlemagne's Merry Christmas mistake. He was reputed to have put an end to the Holy Roman Empire, December 2nd, 1805. Now that's very important to understand. Don't forget that Holy Roman Empire. That has went on for over a millennia. But supposedly, what you'll learn in history is that the Holy Roman Empire finally crumbled once Napoleon started to come in. Once he started to come in, that's when the Holy Roman Empire or the Catholic Church power disintegrated. But it's very important to understand that Catholic power does not have to be some kind of outward secular form. Catholics, they don't have to be in charge of a nation to keep controlling people. As I mentioned to you last, world history class in discipleship, Catholics, they can still have power through dipl uh, diplomacy, diplomatic relations, and then the Jesuits were the ones behind the scenes, undercover, where it's not plainly revealed by the people, where they still gain control through elitist in power. So they don't have to publicly say, hey, I'm a ruler of a nation. They don't really have to do that. They can do it secretly. They can do it sneakily, okay? They can always do that. That's how you can always control people. That's how you always control people. Think about it today. Publicly, we are known to be uh, a nation of democracy, but is it really a nation of democracy when you are to think about it? Has it been done through connections, diplomatic relations? with certain elitists in power where you don't really talk about it? Okay, so you got to use your head. You have to use your head. The Holy Roman Empire supposedly ended through Napoleon's conquest, through Napoleon's rise. However, what we're going to see right here, as Dr. Upman argues, for if, uh, let's see right here, for if the Holy Papa didn't get to do the crowning, he would claim that the empire was no longer holy. This is exactly what happened, and in blind, irrational obedience to the dictates of this Roman egomaniac, all of the historians decided that 1805 does mark the end of the Holy Roman Empire. There is no need to end it there. It was never too holy to start with, and it was, never was an empire to start with. It is in just as good a condition today as it was in AD 800. When Napoleon annexed the Papal States in 1808, he embittered Catholics so that many of them 
join the humanists and atheists to get rid of him. That's important to understand. There's always a connection with Catholics, atheists, and humanists. Now, did you recall that uh, connection in our last world history class when the French Enlightenment came out, the reign of terror? Why is it that you see Catholics, atheists, and humanists all joining hands together? Think about it in this Bay Area. How, wh why do you see Catholics joining hands with humanists and Satanists? Look at some of the universities here, all right? The one, uh -huh, you know, the one over there, okay? <laughs> Let's just say. But the thing is, is notice right here that they're all holding hands together. We are, uh, the Lord's divine protection is truly on this ministry. It, we are basically the thorn in the flesh of Satan, and Satan just probably requested three times to take it out from the Lord, but the Lord never gave him permission yeah, to do so, amen? amen? So the Lord has protected this ministry to give him glory. Anyways, uh, uh, I just wanted to throw that in, <laughs> but besides that, it's important to understand this connection in history. It will go from this time to the end of today. Remember that. Birds of a feather flock together. Never forget that. Never forget that. You're going to see that from the beginning of that historical time. It started when those Jesuits were kicked out. Because why? The Christians, the Protestant nations, uh, with the Baptists on the heels, were crumbling that Holy Roman Empire. So in order for Catholic power to continue, they held hands with these guys. And then you see that this is the public now. Publicly, this is the power now, publicly. Secretly behind the scenes, it's elitist. And Catholics cover both sides everywhere. Continuing on, fortunately, these atheists had a friend in Napoleon's court who also was a baptized, confirmed Roman Catholic. Now, there are two names you're going to have to remember. Uh, I'm only going to give you one for now. The next one, I'll give it later. Talleyrand. Catholic. Everything behind the scenes, you always see a Catholic, 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 Catholic. You cannot escape Catholic. This worthy gentleman followed the, following the Jesuit teaching that the end justifies the means that oaths are not binding, if, etc. Advised revolutionaries against each other and advised Prussian, Prussia against Napoleon while serving under Napoleon as his foreign minister. It turned out that Protestant Prussian armies at Leipzig at 1813, along with Catholic Austrian armies, helped put Napoleon on ice for a while. Moral, if any pope really gets hard pressed, he will make ecumenical overtures to Protestants so that he can use their military forces. That's a good one. It's a uh, funny thing. He said, that's a good one, too, when you said that's good. <laughs> Remember what I told you. Diplomatic relations. Like the ecumenical movement today. Like the Council of Churches. Shall I continue on? That's how you continue your power. It is well known that when the Catholic Emperor Napoleon returned from Elba, March 1st, 1815, he was defeated by the predominantly Protestant Englishmen and Protestant Prussians at Waterloo, June 18th, 1815. So immediately a Catholic Holy Alliance was set up under Pope Alexander I to reinstate the Catholic Pope as ruler of a revived Holy Roman Empire. He couldn't get back in, but at least Vienna in Catholic Austria, was chosen as the center of the alliance, which took in Prussia and Russia. And Napoleon had been the originator of this holy alliance. Vienna was chosen again in the 1960s to be the center for the Nuclear Power Commission of the United Nations. It is in a country where the Catholics outnumber all other religious beliefs by better than 100 to 1. You must take off your hat to the Vatican. If their popes are not honest, they are cer certainly industrious. So notice right here how Catholics have survived publicly through connections, through diplomatic relations.
That's how they always infamously survived. Now I'm going to uh, read you uh, Frederick Widowson's bo uh, book, A Bible Believer's Guide to World History. I'm going to give you more of the historical details. So we're going to look at the actual historical details on how Napoleon was able to rise and conquer the world and how he lost. Page 305, how the French continued to be successful on land, and in 1795, the government was replaced by the Directory, a five-man committee. So remember, this, the reign of terror was very chaotic, all right, if you recall that from the French Enlightenment. They were trying to follow the principle of equality, liberty, that sounds like America, but the difference with America and France, remember, was America was founded on a Baptist principle. Morality was there. So be only because of that, it kept going. But if you truly do liberty equality, you get chaos. That's why Musk's Twitter didn't really work that way. You need to put in a Christian context. You need to put that in a Christian context. That's how it's successful. So the government's replaced by this five-man committee. You can guess who's one of them, okay? General Napoleon Bonaparte, who started out as a second lieutenant of artillery, rose to prominence with his military command and defeated all comers, using military genius and strict discipline of those he commanded to wield the French into a formidable fighting force. He ruled France as the first consul of the French Republic in 1799, but then after a failed plot to kill him, which he used as an excuse to restore the hereditary monarchy of France, had himself declared Napoleon I, Emperor of France, in 1804. And unlike Charlemagne, he took the crown from the Pope's hands and crowned himself. Some saying this was his refusal to acknowledge the Pope's supremacy, while others say it was planned in advance by all parties. So we don't know. Like I told you, um, Catholic power, they're so sneaky. They always uh, survive. As you can tell from history, it seems like Napoleon is anti-Catholic. But from what you see from Bible believers, they refuse to separate that connection. They strongly believe Catholic connection always remain, no matter what. Remember this, the Catholic power is so sneaky. Whether you're for them or against them, they'll find a way to sneak in there. Both anti and pro-Catholic. They'll find their way to sneak in there carry on their powers. That's so important to remember. To be a successful elitist, you can't just hold hands with your friends. You have to find a way through your enemies. Anyways, continuing on, uh, let's see right here. He crowned his wife, Josephine, as empress. Very humble man. You can see that right there. Napoleon was at constant odds with Pope Pius VII who desperately wanted the return of the papal states the papacy once controlled and lands in Germany that he had lost to German princes who had seized them and that had been lost by treaties. Eventually, Napoleon would be excommunicated when he conquered the papal states in 1808. France had conquered them previously in the 1790s, but restored them to the papacy in 1800 and annexed them to France. The Pope was then kidnapped, although some say not by Napoleon's orders. So wonder whose orders? Maybe the people who the Pope kicked out of the Vatican. And during their suppression and exile, they had no home to go to, so they held hands with Masons and started those elitist clubs. But anyways, continuing on. Nevertheless, Napoleon did not offer his release, and he remained in confinement for six years, being pressured to give up his power altogether or to sign a concordat with Napoleon. He was restored in 1814 by the British as they chased Napoleon down. He then asked for better treatment of the former emperor, exiled on St. Helena, Helena Island after being defeated for the last time at the Battle of Waterloo, having escaped from his exile on the island of Elba and governing France for a hundred days. Okay, well, let's look at page 314 here. Before we just give his life a close, let's give more of the details what happened. There was peace between England and France with the 1802 Treaty of Amiens, Amiens, which was ended in 1803, 
When Britain imposed a naval blockade of Europe while Napoleon planned to invade England, British sea power stood in his way and made the invasion impossible. In fact, the British Navy was considered to be the only thing standing in between Napoleon and domination of the world. Napoleon was crowned emperor in 1804, and in 1805 Britain, Britain joined forces with Austria, Russia, and Sweden against him. Napoleon took the initiative, abandoning plans to invade England, and his grand army marched eastward, defeating his Austrian enemies again. He marched on Vienna, Austria's capital, and defeating a Russian, uh, Russian force and occupied it by the end of 1805. Napoleon marched north and met the Allied forces again at the Battle of Austerlitz in December of 1805, defeating them conclusively in what is considered one of the most brilliant military battles of history. So Napoleon, he's not a dumb guy. He's been very, very clever. The war at sea did not go as well for Napoleon with the great defeat at the Sea Battle of Trafalgar at the hands of Admiral Nielsen, in which Nelson was, uh, excuse me, not Nielsen, Nelson, in which Nelson was mortally wounded aboard his flagship, flagship victory as he closed in violent combat with the French ship Redoubtable in October before Austerlitz. On land, Napoleon controlled central and western Germany and in 1806 ended the Holy Roman Empire's existence after a thousand years of rule. So, but like Dr. Ruckman argued, never was an empire to be, uh, begin with anyway. It was always in good condition. Basically, it's a Catholic entity that always remained and had control. That's the bottom line. Francis II Emperor became Francis I Emperor of Austria. Napoleon defeated the Prussians at the Battle of Jena and Auerstadt. Napoleon's victories were masterpieces of generalship and had a tremendous psychological effect on his enemies. By November 30th of 1806, the conqueror marched into Poland, having invaded Austria, Germany, and Prussia. Napoleon had several great generals rise to prominence under his command, among these being Ney and Murat. The result of the Polish campaign was a truce with Russia and Napoleon becoming the virtual ruler of all Western and Central Europe by 1807. Okay, that spells trouble, okay? Napoleon has connection with Russia now, and then he was conquering all parts of Europe. And like I told you before, it's interesting, these are countries that were kicking out the Vatican, I mean, kicking out the Jesuits, right? So it's pretty strange. Now, England, Great Britain alone faced him. According to Alan Shom in his book, Napoleon Bonaparte, the conqueror's followers stated that he was beyond normal human history now, that he was a giant that belonged more appropriately to more heroic times. Ominously, at this time, the famous Prime Minister, Talleyrand, who had seemed to serve Napoleon so well as he had served the king before him, resigned over the thin Franco-Russian alliance. It is believed now that Talleyrand was a traitor to the emperor, assisting hostile powers with information. All right. Franco-Russian, uh, page 320, uh, 315, Franco-Russian relations had become frayed as Poland, formerly under Russian domination, was reviving as a power under Napoleon. Napoleon refused to help Tsar Alexander, Russia's ruler, fight the Turks. England appealed to Russia. So England's now taking advantage. Okay, Russia, so now maybe you should help us. Don't side with Napoleon. Then Russia renounced Napoleon's continental system. Okay, now Napoleon's losing it. The attempt to keep Britain isolated. Now, isn't it amazing how God's hand was protecting England all that time? Mm -hmm. And how America was growing prosperously? These are the two countries. Remember, if you go centuries behind, is the birth of where the King James Bible was born Amen. and the Baptists were coming out too Amen. in England and America. Europe forsook it. Notice, notice the fruits of Calvinism right there. Right? They didn't want the Anabaptists, right? Who were the early guys before the Baptists. 
They didn't want the Anabaptist. See God's hand and blessing behind the scenes? Amen. All right? So Amen. don't be a Calvinist. Lesson learned, okay? Amen. If you want a post-millennial successful kingdom, okay, <laughs> on earth. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. Uh, let's see right here. In 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia, and like Hitler after him, was finally destroyed, not by human effort, but by the frozen winter. Yeah. With his army all but wiped out in the long retreat from Russia, he was reduced to desperately defending France. His empire crumbled because Russia, you know, is very hot over there, as you know. <laughs> Some of you didn't catch that, right? Okay. So Russia with that, uh, that Siberian winter and all that cold, I mean, the... Caesar and the Russians were so clever where they made Napoleon just chase, 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 chase. And they were used to the winter and they knew all and they had all the resources and they knew how to survive. Napoleon's army was just crushed out. His entire empire, his powerful empire crumbled. Napoleon blamed his efforts in Spain for tying down so much of his resources that he could not be successful. But history shows that it was his poorly thought out idea of invading Russia that finished him. Why? Because he always relied on his own tactics, brilliant tactics. So no one's going to tell him what to do. And God made sure that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A renewed British invasion of the Iberian Peninsula in 1809 under the great British General uh, Wellesley had proven disastrous. However, for France and England's superior sea power was also a factor. Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba in 1814, but in 1815 returned for the reign of the Hundred Days in 1815. So even though Napoleon was defeated, he was exiled, he got back out again. I'm going to make a comeback. Finally being defeated by the British Duke Wellington and Prussian General Blush, uh, Blusher at the Battle of Waterloo. He was then exiled to the island of St. Helena, where he died in 1821. So hence we see right here that Napoleon, the great power, the brilliant general, he was exiled once, but he was able to get out and summon up another war. And then the European powers, they were trying to fight him, but again, uh, they failed. Uh, excuse me, Napoleon failed and then they were able to win. Now, as I've told you before, it, it's very strange how Jesuits were, it seemed to benefit the Jesuits this entire time, what Napoleon was able to accomplish. But then again, Napoleon died. But then again, Jesuits got back as soon as he died. So what's going on? Think about Jesuits' tactics. Their tactics is always to hold hands, including their enemies. That's found in their oath, by the way. And then they can, in return, uh, betray their enemies. Uh, they can betray the people that they're supposedly friends with. I wonder if that could be the case. There are several documented quotes which brings up this concern, actually. So it is very possible that Jesuit powers were behind the scenes. And there are several reasons why. One is because of how it benefited the Jesuits. It's very strange how it always benefited the Jesuits with Napoleon's conquest and even during his fall. Another thing is by, because of a person named Emmanuel Joseph Sees. Now, Emmanuel Joseph sees, it is documented right here, according to Ritpass Universal History, the priest was a prime mover of the French Revolution, the directory, and was the second consul on Napoleon's consulate. But who is Abbey Sees? He was Jesuit trained one of the chief political thinkers and writers of the period of the French Revolution and the First Empire. He was destined for the church, was educated by the Jesuits, became a licentiate of the canon law. Now, what's the canon law? That's that Council of Trent. Do you remember the Council of Trent? Come 
Did you forget all those things that I quoted to you from the Council of Trent? Yeah. Basically, let him be anathema, let him be cursed. He was from that background. It's very strange that you get Talleyrand and Abby C's as well. So there seems to be some kind of Catholic or Jesuit factor behind the scenes. Now, here's another thing. How did Napoleon die, right? So we had uh, Sister Eunice right here, you know, only, only seven, just saying, you know, I know how he died. He was poisoned, and I'm like, don't ruin my teaching, actually. <laughs> he was poisoned, but... Think about it. That's a, th a third factor now to consider Jesuit connection. Yeah. If you look back in Jesuit assassination attempts and plots, do you know why the kings and no nobility were kicking out Jesuits, the Catholic and Protestants? They seem to die by drinking the poison. Mm -hmm. Come on. Now, if you don't believe me, you can look that up. That's what they were mainly concerned about is because they, they would be poisoned or drink the poison. Jesuits were very c clever tacticians on that one. So isn't it strange Napoleon died through poisoning, if that be the case. Here's another one. Fourth factor, Robespierre. Remember him, Robespierre? He was uh, important during uh, France when we, went, when we go from the reign of terror to Napoleon's rise. Robespierre graduated from a Jesuit institution, College de Clermont, Paris. All right. That's another one to consider. Now, I gave you this quote before uh, by a physician in 1968, uh, Emmanuel M. Josephson. The title of the book is uh, The Federal Res uh, Reserve Conspiracy and Rockefellers. He, he said this, Weishaupt and his fellow Jesuits, remember that's the Illuminati, Weishaupt, right? Cut off the income to the Vatican by launching and leading the French Revolution. So notice they're paying back against the Vatican for being kicked out. By directing Napoleon's conquest of Catholic Europe. So supposedly Jesuits were the ones who led Napoleon to conquer Catholic Europe. And by eventually having Napoleon throw Pope Pius VII in jail at Avignon until he agreed as the price for his release to reestablish the Jesuit order. So that's why the Pope was imprisoned and they took over the Vatican. Jesuits want to come back into power again. Supposedly, let me just add that at the end. Supposedly, supposedly. This Jesuit war on the Vatican was terminated by the Congress of Vienna and by the secret 1822 Treaty of Verona. And I've already mentioned a little bit of that to you from Dr. Rutman's church history book, but it's in a Catholic territory. It's always strange that even privately behind the scenes in secret, it, Catholics gain from it. Publicly, in front of our world history books, Catholics still gain from it. They always cover their tracks. That's how you become a clever, powerful organization. Now, Napoleon, he said this, Alas, I knew they would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner. Who's the they that he believed? Well, it may be his enemies. It could be inclusive of these people that Napoleon warned. So this is from Napoleon's own mouth. So this is the last factor why we would suspect uh, Jesuit hands behind all of this is Napoleon himself. He said the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms 
and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master, sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work. Wow. They will do whatever means necessary to accomplish victory. If committed for the interest of the society of the Jesuits or by the order of the general. End of quote. Strange stuff. Also, uh, some people claim that uh, Napoleon had dealings with Masons. So if you build up all these factors together, you see that Jesuits' hands, you can't separate them from history, even during Napoleon's era. Very strange stuff. So the poison seemed to show a Jesuit connection right here. We see Abbey C's his connection. And we also see Napoleon's himself, his own warning about them. All right. Now, to say all of this, I can say this 100% for a fact. We can say maybe, we can say supposedly, but there is no doubt about this. That what you hear from history books about Catholics not benefiting from when Napoleon rose in power and then when he was defeated is a total bunk. Yeah. What you can see right here is that the Holy Roman, uh, that the Catholic power, Catholic power still benefited and still increased its power. It just changed forms. That's important to understand is the Catholic change of power. If you understand this, then you can see that the enemy, uh, he didn't just survive, but he thrived. Continuing from Frederick Widdowson's book on page 315, the major powers of Europe met at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 to redraw the map of Europe and restore hereditary monarchies that Napoleon had overthrown. So supposedly the Holy Roman Empire is so broken, it's so weak, it's so messed up, remember, okay? Supposedly, that's what you know from the history books. So then, what are they going to do? Well, what they've decided to do, among the decision makers at the Congress was Metternich, an important Austrian statesman. Cesar Alexander proposed a holy alliance which wanted to uphold the type of church and state union that had dominated politics in Europe for so long. Yeah, Catholic wants that, right? Church and state. The problem was the growing menace to them of liberty and freedom in the young, guess who's the enemy? United States of America. Oh, wow. Europe, powerful Europe is scared, and that's just a fledgling United States after the American Revolutionary War. Why are they so scared? Why are they so scared of that small country? There's no doubt you can see God's hand behind the whole, thing, uh, whole scene from history. President Monroe in the United States formulated the Monroe Doctrine, which demanded that the European powers stay out of the Western Hemisphere. Although the Holy Alliance is supposed to have died with the death of Cesar Alexander in 1825, it was claimed that various popes and the heads of Catholic European countries actually worked behind the scenes to harm the American Republic. America's evolving concept and constitutional guarantee of freedom of religion was seen as a threat to sovereigns everywhere who did not believe in freedom of conscience and did believe the head of state had much to say about the religious practices of his subjects. The divine right of kings as a concept died hard. We'll come back to here. And you're going to find out where, as we come back to here, the Catholic powers why America was a huge threat and what they've done to weaken that nation. And then we'll carry on to what's going on with Lincoln, the Civil War. Anyway, I digress, okay? We'll talk about that a little later, but 
We are in probably, like I told you, the most action-packed historical timeline of what's going on behind the scenes. All right. So what is America doing? Building up church state, becoming powerful through those means? No. Those means of like uh, the industry, the technology, the civil civilization, the education increased following Great Awakening revivals. That laid the foundation. It's always morality. It's always Christian morality. And after that, all these other physical means will come to you because you got a God who provides all your needs. And he blesses and takes care of his children. And you know that for your own individual life that God does that if you get your heart right with God first and you get convicted by the preaching of the word of God. Amen. Now, all of you can say amen to that. All of you are witnesses amen. of that, you and I. So that's why it's so important. Uh, this preaching the word of God, it's not... Yeah infiltration of politics in the schools. You're going to find out when Christians did that, that's when it went downhill. That's right. I'm going to show you that later on in history. That's when it went all downhill. You need your heart right with God first. Yeah. Get your doctrines in place. Let the word of God be the foundation. All those other things will build itself up. Amen. And even if they don't, then God's will be done because the kingdoms of this world belong to the devil and God's going to make sure that he takes care of his people and he'll win in the end. <laughs> Amen. People trying to build the kingdom themselves. It always messes up. Right. You learn that in history. It's amazing that if you want to talk about a secular kingdom out of the entire world history, world history from Genesis 1 all the way to the end, the only kingdoms that thrived and were the most prosperous are the nation of Israel, England, and United States of America. Only these three when they followed God's will. But as soon as they rejected God's will, you noticed how it went down the drain. Welcome to the times that we're living in. That's why it's going downhill. Make, Amer make America great again? Not happening. Not happening. Yep. Noble, noble cause what you guys are trying to do, but you notice it's not through preaching of the word of God they build it up. It's through politics, it's through education, it's through media, etc., You'll never get a successful kingdom that way. Ever, never, ever. And I want people in this church to remember what I'm ranting about today. If you forget everything that I'm talking about, the most important thing in church history is never, ever get uh, mingled the church with the state. Combine the Bible with politics and every uh, uh, education. Amen. Stuff like that. That's why seminaries are the reason Christianity went downhill. You're going to find out. Ah. Politics are the reason why things start to fall apart. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> Let's talk about what God was doing now. America became a threat to the European powers, to the elitists. And notice how many times they tried to infiltrate inside the country and outside through the European powers. They still survived and thrived. They were still extremely powerful. All because people who are bred by the word of God. The Great Awakening Revival was, man, it was unfathomable. You got the first Great Awakening Revival, and the first Great Awakening was John Wesley, George Whitfield, and the other people. What you're going to find out, and Dr. Upman, he has a map right here, which is very interesting, and we're going to go through it the next couple of lessons here. It's extremely interesting how he did this. But if you look at his map in his New Testament church history book, on uh, page 82, he has a map showing the Holy Spirit's moving from east to west. And how it started, remember, was Jonathan Edwards. If it starts with Jonathan Edwards all the way to the area where Maine is located, the top of the United States, he draws that map where it goes all the way down to the west at California. That's where it ends. That's where the revival ends. That's why Billy Graham was literally the last of that. And in the middle of his ministry, you see that he fell. See, California, believe it or not, our state was the end. Wow. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? So we're going to go from first great awakening. Nothing, nothing topped the first great awakening. I mean, the revival results is phenomenal with Wesley, Whitfield, and those guys. So other great awakenings paled compared to the first one. But it was still big. It was still very big. But John Wesley Whitfield, these guys were definitely, uh, definitely 
had so much revival. The reason why, which is important, was they still had a fresh Baptist or Christian heritage who moved into America. The key is the people. You get the people, then you're going to have big revival. Yes. But if people's hearts don't respond, then you're not going to get it. That's anti-Calvin teaching. You notice that. Yeah. Depends on the hearts of the people where the Holy Spirit can get victory and work on them. So we come now to the second great awakening revival. What you're going to notice, and I'm going to show you, is that in every great awakening, Dr. Ruckman argues there were seven great awakenings. Wow. Seven great awakenings. Normally what you're going to hear is mainly two. Mainly two. But Dr. Ruckman, he did a very good job where he divides it further to seven. And it's so interesting that within these seven series of great awakenings, you also see that enemy of ours never left and how they tried to ruin as every great awakening kept going. It's literally a battle of heaven and hell. And you're going to see that. Well, we've seen how hell moved through the Napoleonic Wars and the Catholic rise of power. Uh, you heard about the Illuminati and all that. This was after the first great awakening. Wesley Whitfield, these guys. So you see how the devil moved. But now God's not done. He's not done. He's like, no, I'm going to get a second one going. Here we go. Yes. Page 87 in Dr. Upman's book. By the turn of the century, 1800, the Baptist Missionary Society, the London Missionary Society, the Church Missionary Society, the Glasgow Missionary Society, and the Scottish Missionary Society had been formed. By 1824, the work of these missionaries had caused such a stir that the Roman Catholic Pope at Rome was warning the world about Bible societies, <laughs> translating the scripture into the vernacular of all nations. Get to work now. The old bloody killer had reason to worry. The Bible that was being translated was the one that had come from Erasmus's Textus Receptus. The only Greek text that no Roman Catholic Pope or priest would dare recommend to anyone since it came out. Right. Now the missions are spreading. Now the father of modern missions, you want to remember his name. The father of modern missions is William Carey. He was given that title. So now we come to one of the greatest timelines. I mean, Philadelphia, like I told you, is the greatest timeline you could hear. So William Carey, he's known as the father of modern missions. Dr. Upman says on page 88, he received his inspiration from a booklet <coughs> entitled Periodical Account of Moravian Missions. The Moravians influenced him. See what you've done from Bible believers before? They were laying out seeds and then the groundwork. Now other people, they were building up the walls and hitting the rooftops now. He taught himself six languages while working at a cobbler's bench. He's not a rich guy. And then he departed for India where he labored for 42 years to translate the AV into 44 languages and dialects. Carey's motto was, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Amen. That was actually my motto when I built this church. Amen. That's why I believe in keep making it uh, great again, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Through Carey's work, the Netherlands Missionary Society, 1797, the British and Foreign Bible Society, 1804, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, 1810, the American Baptist Missionary Union, 1814, and the American Bible Society, 1816, sprang up. All translations put out by the American and British Bible Societies were from the Receptus of the King James Bible until 1904, at which time England renounced her birthright. So we'll tell you what the devil pulled up that time, all right? So I'll tell you about that later. But anyway, 1806... Samuel Mills felt the call to preach. Yes. Reach. Reach. The gospel to all nations, Amen. and he gathered around him James Richards, Francis Robbins, Harvey Loomis, Gordon Hall, and Luther Rice. They were known as, quote, the haystack group because they met at a haystack to pray for the conversion of the heathen. Amen. They were joined later by... Adoniram Judson, Whoa, wow. Samuel Newell, and Samuel Knott. 
Beginning in 1817 and continuing until 1883, various members connected with this group preached to Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Dakota Indians. Judson and Newell set sail for India, while other missionary families whom they had influenced wound up in Ceylon, 1816, China, 1830, and Madura, 1834. Christ had said to the ends of the earth, so to the ends of the earth they went. Adoniram Judson wound up in Burma. Amen. Some call him the father of American missions. He set sail from America as a Congregationalist, and he landed in Ragoon as a Baptist. He spent the rest of his life laboring for the souls of the Burmese. He buried two wives and a daughter overseas. And he himself was finally buried at sea off the Burma coast. Judson's time in prison translating the received text is a classic study in Pauline Christianity. Every Christian should be acquainted with it. The hardships which his wife Anne endured is a classic study in the conduct of a submissive wife. Every Christian should read it. So Dr. Upman doesn't read it, but when you read it, it gets you under conviction. It's... I would highly recommend that. He is probably my favorite missionary, Adoniram Judson. He is my favorite missionary. He went through the worst suffering, to be honest. Page 90, Ebenezer Loomis preached in Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan. James Delaney preached in Wisconsin, and Amory Gale in Minnesota. All of these early itinerant circuit riders lived by faith, and none of them died a violent death. Circuit riding preaching is when these preachers rode on horseback, went through town after town after town, like Wesley used to do, and spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here are names that you probably never heard about. Dr. Upman, he covers names that a lot of people don't cover, actually. He studied a lot. This man, I don't know where he gets all this from. I don't know how he gets all this from. But he puts every single name over there. A lot of people. They carried a hymn book and a King James Bible in their saddlebags, and they led multitudes to Christ. A circuit rider had to be tough in body as well as fervent in spirit, and he had to be accustomed to dealing with Indians, bullies, and drunkards. He had to be capable of converting men more familiar with a bowie knife than a prayer meeting. Francois Asbury, that's the name, who probably originated circuit riding. The Methodist preacher, obviously from Wesley, no surprise, because Wesley did that, is probably responsible for the idea of circuit riding. The most highly publicized of the frontier preachers was Peter Cartwright, a short, thick-set man with a fine head and black, beady eyes. When Peter was put on the spot at a conference of Methodist bishops, a bishop addressed him in Greek hoping to make a fool out of him. Uh, Calvinist must have been a... <laughs> <laughs> Peter answered in German, which his mother had taught him. <laughs> Since the bishop didn't know any German, he had to say face quickly, so he backed out by nodding his head vigorously and saying to those nearby, he knows it, he knows it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, next time you get one of these people, the original Greek says, just reply back in German or something. Your foreign language. Show them how smart you are and how dumb they are, maybe. Cartwright was reputed to have knocked sinners down for less than that. On several occasions, he was observed straddling a prospect and threatening him with a fist as big as a Virginia ham and yelling, Don't you feel the spirit of the Lord striving with you, brother? <laughs> Closely, asso closely, associated, closely associated with the Backwoods Circuit Riders was James McGrady, 1798, who, the founder of the American Camp Meeting. So Camp Meeting Revival was from James McGrady. Right here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, McGrady, Mc. Grady, all right. Amen. 
He said Virginia Ham, brother. Who sparked a revival that upset the entire Cumberland Valley. So Cumberland Valley is another name. I just ran out of room, okay? George Godwin, speaking for the educated class and their refined sensibilities, calls him a Bush Baptist and his followers a bunch of ignorant ranters. In the services held by James McGrady, 300 men fell like dead men and sent up loud wailings to heaven for mercy. The same phenomena was found in Wesley's work and Cartwright's. There were 20,000 frontiersmen who came to the first camp meeting in 1801. From all accounts, it set a precedent for American revivalism. Now, just to give you a heads up, um, the unfortunate, uh, remember, none of these people are perfect. So what you're going to find out is some accounts of emotionalism, which is what Calvinists will use to point out that this is not really God's Holy Spirit working. But the idea is this, is that no, it was the Holy Spirit working. But as you might know, now this is important for our church, which is why I put a self-control thing, okay? Right. Uh, the Holy Spirit's moving, the people want to shout, the people want to wail, people want to go on the altar and stuff like that, but our flesh can easily get in the way and then it goes out of bounds, okay? That's why I stress so much about this church, about self-control, and I've talked to some of you about that as well. So it's important that uh, we can't let the flesh, emotionalism, get in the way. So unfortunately, that was the case. However, like I mentioned to you before, the Holy Spirit used it. Many people got right with God. Many people got saved. Um, the Cumberland Valley Revival, page 92, brought about the second great awakening in America. So that's the important name, Cumberland Valley Revival. The Holy Spirit, following his usual custom, had moved west and this time slightly southwest. So from Maine, more to the New York areas, right? A milder reaction from the revival took place in New England at this time, but it had less emotional excitement and less controversy connected with it than the first awakening. That is, it accomplished less. Mm -hmm. So that's something important to think about. With the second great awakening came the work of Charles G. Finney. That's a famous name. Who spent the first 20 years of his life in obscurity in the wilderness south of Lake Ontario and in the thinly populated Oneida County of New York. According to Shearer, when Finney arose, the New England churches were in a sickly state. Hyper-Calvinism and Universalism were the staple food for a Roman and pagan population. For the Catholics had filled in the vacuum in Connecticut and Massachusetts as soon as the Holy Spirit had finished his work and passed on. Wow. Remember what Jefferson warned about the immigrants? Yeah. Bringing in the Catholic and the state ideology? They swarmed in and they ruined the first Great Awakening work. But the Lord set up a second Great Awakening. It's a battle with heaven and hell. Continuing on, the revival of which Finney rode the crest began in the Fulton Street Dutch Reformed Church in New York City, west of Massachusetts and Connecticut, and other forces quickly entered in. There were United Men's Prayer Meetings going on at the same time in Exeter Hall, Crosby Hall, and North Barnsbury Hall in London. And of course, the Cumberland Valley Revival was in full swing. He came in the right time, Finney. Finney put the burden of responsibility for his salvation back on the individual, exactly as the pietists had done. Don't forget the pietists were the one responsible for starting out some mission work that the uh, Reformed and the Lutherans were very dead. Pietists were more of the emotional type, right? Wow. Cumberland Valley Revival was very emotional. Finney came at that right time. And we will end it off right here and continue on with Charles Finney, all right? This is the guy, if you read uh, Reese's booklet on Charles Finney, he would go inside a factory and then lead them all to Christ, that the factory manager just shut down the factory and made them all hear the gospel. Amen. Finney, I mean, this was, this is huge, second great awakening. And we didn't even come to number seven, all right? We're at the second. The best is yet to come. And then what can the Catholic powers do during that time? What can the Jesuits do? Don't forget France, the schools. And at the same time, one of the first cults in America start to rise. Unitarian Church, Church of Christ, Mormonism. Let's see how heaven and hell battle for the United States of America. 
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the truth of your word and for understanding our history. Lord, we are living still in that history. It did not end, Lord, tonight. My lesson did not end. We're living in it now. And the battle for heaven and hell is still going. How many Christians have fallen? I pray that we'll be uh, inspired, motivated, convicted not to fall into the traps of hell, but to be in the battle. We are in a battle. And to keep pressing on for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.